Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Sounds good. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see the presentation? Yep. Okay. So today is week six. Um, so we're going to be covering motion, flow, and aesthetic for a design lecture. Um, and then for our programming lecture, we're going to cover um, CSS animation, which Jay will talk about later. Before we get into the lecture content, I want to go over some announcements first. So homework five and lab five, as usual, are due um, or have been due. So homework five is due before this lecture and then lab five was due last Friday. Um, one announcement is that if you have CSP accommodations, please email us at ask at wdd.io um, or email any one of the instructors with the DSP letter. Um, this is because like, we haven't received anyone's DSP letters directly, so we actually don't know whether you have the DSP accommodations. Um, so it would be best if you could send it to us directly so that we could have that easy access to your letter. For homework six and lab six, um, they have both been released already. Um, lab six is due this Friday as usual per our normal deadline. However, homework six has been pushed back to be due on Friday, October 22nd, which is the same deadline as lab seven for next week. Um, and it was pushed back because this upcoming Tuesday is actually when your midterm project is going to be due. So that is worth a lot more points than your homework in lab. So make sure that you really get that done. Um, it is very hard, if not impossible, for you to pass this class without turning in your midterm project. So make sure you get that in on time. Um, I believe our late policy is that if you turn it in after the deadline, it will be half credit. Um, and because it's worth so much, like half credit will be a big deduction from your grade. Again, uh, for a midterm project, please submit on both the portal. Sorry, that should not include portal. We do not have a portal anymore. You should submit on the Google form by October 19th, which is, which is next Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. The submission form is linked on that slide right there. I'm actually going to delete the portal part right now. And then Thursday lab, which is next Thursday, um, October 21st, we will provide two points of extra credit for everyone who comes to this lab because we will be doing midterm project presentations. So essentially, we will pick all of the top 10 um, projects. Um, that we think did the best, and we will have the people present their projects um, in lab. So please come and support your classmates, and also just as an incentive, you will get two points of extra credit. And then finally, again, if you have any questions about like homework and lab assignments, or even midterm projects, um, for example, if you don't know how to implement a certain functionality into your website, um, please come through to our office hours. They're posted on Piazza. Um, so there's basically no excuse for you like not being able to like finish something because we have a variety of office hours provided for you guys to come to. All right, so first off, I want to discuss motion and flow. Uh, motion and flow is really important um, and it's basically like the realm of animations. Um, but I'm gonna talk about like when to use animations um, how to use animations and like why you should or should not use animations. Um, on websites, animations can give a lot of personality, but it's kind of like a slippery slope. Like having too much animation is bad actually. So it's really important to not get carried away with um, your usage of animations. But usually when the animations are really subtle um, and very well integrated into your website, and then it looks really nice and it brings out an additional like feel to the user uh, when they visit your website. So this is an example of <clears throat> a usage of animation. Um, this is not real, it's just like a pretend <laughs> animation, but um, it, from the surface level, like when you first look at this animation, you'll probably be like, oh, it's like super cool. Like you can see like 
the different parts of the receipt sort of like folding out um, and then you can see like the different like fade in animations of the text for each of the items that you purchased from the store. Uh, and then at the very bottom, there's like a QR code that kind of flips out as well. Um, so like your immediate impression of this is that, oh, like this is super cool. Like, you know, like when you fold your, re your like receipt, it's like the same way that you like, this animation is like folding out the receipt on your screen. Um, but actually this animation um, is unnecessary and it's also, a bit too slow. Um, like when you want to visit a website, like you want to see the information displayed like directly, right? And you don't want to wait like three to five seconds for all the information to be shown on your screen. Uh, so this would be a really cool animation if you just want to like put it there without like any functionality or like user interaction. But if you actually want the user to like be able to click on the item or like be able to scan the QR code, this is a really like inefficient animation to implement. Um, so again, like be really careful about like when and where to use animations because this is an example of like where you shouldn't use the animation because it's really slow um, and it takes too long for all the information to propagate on the website. So kind of to summarize what I said on the previous slide, animations should not be the main attraction. Um, the best uses of animation are for loading screens, assisting in user experience, and creatively expressing ideas. So make sure that you use animation sparingly and in the right places. And ultimately, you still want to let the content speak for itself. Um, so on the right side, there's an example of this like sort of scrolling down, refreshing feature. Um, and as you can see, like when you let go of it, it has this like like circle bubble thing that pops up. Um, like it's really cool animation, but like depending on the circumstance when you're using this animation, it might not be necessary. Um, especially if you're making an app that like really values like the customer's time, or for example, you really want to like streamline a certain process, you probably don't want to be inserting like random animations um, like here and there, um, especially when it's something as frequently used as the refreshing feature. Um, so again, like make sure that when you're using animation, it's to bring out the important content on your page. You don't want to be attracting attention away from the important features that you want to highlight on your page. So this is an example of um, what a website might look like before using animation. So as you can see on the left side, there's like a sidebar with a bunch of links um, to different pages of the site. So when you hover the mouse over each link. Um, you can see like the right side, like the actual content of that page, it changes super rapidly. Um, and so this kind of creates a sort of like jarring transition between like, for example, going from um, lifestyle to like graphic design, for example. Um, like the page on the side is like super like, it flips way too fast and it's hard for your eyes to like really I guess, digest that information. Um, and it's generally just not as pleasing um, to the human eye. Um, so this is an example of where animation could actually come in use. So the after version of this is when you do incorporate animation. So as you can see, when the mouse hovers from the lifestyle to like another page, um, it has a lot of really cool animation effects going on that loads the different parts of the page. So instead of the entire page just like flip flopping like really dramatically, um, it incorporates like a lot of like slide in, slide out um, animations um, for the different like title, like the heading section, and then like the images and the text on the bottom, so that it makes a more, a much more smooth transition for the user's eyes to look at. And so this is an example of where animations can really help. Um, so. In case you want to like implement this sort of like animation into your navigation on your websites, um, it might be a bit technically difficult to do so because of the fact that you have to deal with like routing and navigation elements. Um, so unfortunately, like with the scope of this class, you won't be able to learn how to do this animation between pages. Um, but if you want to go above and beyond and like research other articles and resources that might teach you how to do this, like it would look really cool, especially for your final project. 
Um, so yeah, this is an example of how you can incorporate animations to make something as simple as like navigating across pages like a lot more smooth and a lot more visually pleasing. So next, um, I want to go over some resources that people use to like mock up animations or even just like wireframes and like apps in general. So Envision is a really good resource. Um, I personally never used it, but I think the former instructor who created these slides, Asia, she like recommended these, um, which is like probably why she put them in the slides. So Envision is a really good resource if you want to like make inspiration boards, um, make like prototypes, etc. cetera. Um, but I guess for the sake of this class, like Figma is probably good enough for what you want to achieve, but this is just an additional resource if you want to look into it. And then the next one is a really popular one that people use, um, Adobe After Effects. So Adobe After Effects, I also never use personally, but it's mainly um, about like animation design, motion graphics, um, and it's pretty advanced in terms of like what I can do. Um, so if you ever want to create like really fancy animations, um, I would recommend looking into Adobe After Effects. Um, I think it, there's probably a lot of tutorials out there that can guide you in creating like really cool animations that you can incorporate onto your website. So yeah, this is another resource that you can look into. Okay, now moving on to the second part of this, this design lecture, which is aesthetic. Um, aesthetic is a really broad general term um, to refer to what I'm going to describe later, but like, I mean, whenever you look at a website, like even if there's no like CSS or styling or like very minimal styling happening, it still has an aesthetic. Like every website has an aesthetic. Um, so it's a really important concept um, and I'm going to describe it um, in the next few slides. So before we get into sort of like the main concept here, um, let's bring together everything we've learned so far with a quick crash course in branding. So what are some things that we know already? So kind of like summarizing all of the design lectures that have happened so far um, through this semester, um, we've covered color scheme, um, which, you know, governs like the way that we use colors on our website, how we can use them effectively to bring out the character and personality of our website. So um, some important concepts that are related to color scheme could be like um, using like primary and complementary colors, um, a lot of other like more specific color combinations that um, Isabel covered during her lecture. Um, but I think one of the like strongest um, pieces of advice that I like tend to remember uh, when I'm creating a website is to um, like make sure that like all the colors match well with each other. Um, and you want to make sure like if you're using a really saturated color, like make sure that like there's a reason for it because saturated colors, like they tend to stand out a lot more and it's a bit jarring, especially when you have more muted colors in the background, for example. So um, I love using coolers.co as like a palette generating tool. So like that's a really useful resource that you can use um, to make sure that like the colors that you're using really match well with each other. The next one is typography. So everything that is related to fonts that you use on your website. So like basically almost every website out there uses text, right? And so that text has to be communicated through a specific font style, through a specific font weight, font styles, um, even like the colors of the fonts you use is really important, um, even though that's not like the font itself. Um, and so one important concept here is like using sans serif versus serif fonts and like why you would use one over the other for specific parts of your website. Um, and the hierarchy of your like text sections um, is really important because that's how you decide like when and where to use specific font styles. And then Another like really strong piece of advice that I like try to keep in mind is to use a maximum of two to three um, types of font styles per website. Because the more you have, the messier it gets and the more cluttered it gets. And then your design no longer is as cohesive as um, if you had like used 
like two to three fonts max. The next one is images and graphics. Um, I believe I covered this last week. So when it comes to images, like really know like the image type you're using and like when to use them and make sure you're using like the highest quality images possible. Um, you don't want to like have the user like zoom in and like the image will look really pixelated. Like that's just gonna communicate that like your website is unprofessional, um, it's not well designed and you didn't really pay attention to detail. And then finally we have layout, which is really important because this is how like users kind of like parse your website. So like naturally humans or like English speaking like people or like most languages, you read from like left to right, up to down, right? So like that's the natural flow of like how a user's eyes would travel the web page. So you want to make sure that the layout you use is um, optimal for the kind of content that you want to display on your website. And now we're kind of discussing how like motion can um, contribute to this idea of like a website aesthetic. So now the main concept here is brand personality theory. So what exactly is brand personality theory? Um, basically, like when you think of like a company or a product, like when you visit their landing page, like the landing page is really there so that it makes a really good first impression on the user. Um, like you want to communicate a certain like type of personality to the customer um, so that you can get them to like buy or like use your product or service, right? And so like your whole branding is gonna revolve around the sort of personality that your company or product conveys to its potential users. And so that's kind of like the whole idea of a brand personality theory. theory. Um, so um, I think in Asia's words, it's like, it touches on the parasocial bonds with companies. Um, so it's really about like defining like what kind of character and personality you want to convey to the users. On your website. So now let's walk through some examples. So the first one is Stripe. Um, and actually, I'm going to zoom out and show these websites um, in my browser. So Stripe is really interesting. Um, it has a very strong emphasis on its design. As you can see here, like we have like a gradient um, background that moves. So again, this is like a really good example of how motion is implemented into the website. Um, yeah, so like the gradient background is super cool. It kind of draws a lot of attention to this area of the screen. Um, and because that area of the screen overlaps with this title right here, that's like what it draws our eyes to as well. So not only do we see like these cool colors happening in the background, but we also pay a lot of attention to this. So again, like when you're using animations or motion in your website, you want to make sure that it doesn't draw attention away from the most important content on your page, which here it would be the title, right? And then as you can see, they use images and icons really effectively here. Um, typically, a lot of websites tend to go for this sort of layout on their landing page. So they have like the text on the left side, and then on the right side, they have like this um, basically like screenshot or like mock-up of what their product looks like. And so this is a really good um, visual display to the users of like what their product looks like um, if they were to use it. And then as we scroll, as you can see, there's like very subtle like animations that happen. I don't know if you noticed, see like it just happened here. Um, there's like a very slight movement um, on the screen and it just kind of gives like a very like interactive, playful feel to it. Um, so that's kind of like how they use motion in this section. Yeah, so again, like the animations they use, it's not like in your face, like really jarring. It's like very intentional um, and it's subtle enough that like it doesn't interfere with the main idea of your website. And then as you can see here, there's, um, a lot of like animations going on with like the code typing. So this is also really cool. And a lot of like technology websites tend to use this a lot because they want to show like, oh, like developers can use this product and this is what it would look like if you want to code with that API, et cetera. So yeah, this is another way you can like use um, 
motion and animation. So the next one is Robin Hood. And as you can see, um, it's, it uses really, really vibrant green colors. Um, like my face is like green right now because of the reflective screen. Um, so Robin Hood, I think it tends to promote more to like younger generations of like students or people who are like interested in starting their investments. Um, like they're like, yeah, they want to like invest in stocks or whatever, or buy like Bitcoin or something like that. So you can see that they use animations here on this like mobile device, like I guess preview. Um, and so it's really, really subtle. Like it doesn't take up too much space because it's only on the screen of this iPhone here. Uh, so this is a really effective use of motion as well. And then as you scroll, you can see that there's a lot of really nice graphics. Um, and it's, it's actually surprisingly detailed. Like this hot air balloon, um, there's like shadows and the lines are actually pretty thin, which is, um, I would say like uncommon for a lot of graphics that companies use on the website. Uh, so this is like a bit more on like the artistic side of things, which I think fits well with this website theme. So yeah, again, we have like more animations here. Um, see, like when I navigate between these two tabs, like, or these three tabs, there's a very like, very fast, but like obvious, like fade in effect that comes into play. And it makes it a lot easier for the user's eyes to like adjust to the next item that they see. Yeah, this is also a really good example of how um, they use different like components and elements of like design to communicate like a very different personality and branding to the user. And next we have Zoom, which as you can see, it's very much the opposite of Robin Hood in terms of like, especially the first thing you notice is that the colors are like completely the opposite, right? Like there's, no, there's barely any usage of like super bright colors. All the bright colors are very like small. Like this orange button here, it's really small. And then the zoom itself, it's like a blue um, logo. Um, and you can see that blue kind of be used throughout the website here. Um, but again, like the majority of the page is just like white and gray muted colors, um, which really match the sort of personality that it's trying to give to the customers because I think the Zoom, they have a more like professional and corporate feel to them. So that's why they use like less saturated colors um, because it tends to be more professional and more like formal and corporate. And then next we have Discord. Um, so this is like the landing page of Discord. And as you know, we use Discord for our design decals. So um, you probably have stumbled upon this page at least once in your life. Um, so as you can see, Discord is sort of similar to like Robin Hood in the way that it's like marketing to younger generations. Um, so as opposed to Zoom where they use very like muted colors and like the fonts are not like in your face or like very fancy, um, Discord is the opposite. So they use a lot of graphics here. Um, so like a lot of these like sort of like cartoony character graphics. Um, the blue in the background is also pretty like stand out um, and it really attracts your attention. And so like the first thing you probably see is like these graphics on the side and then like the title here, which is like imagine a place. And then they put the two most important buttons like here. Um, so it really like draws the user's eyes to like click on these buttons first. And then as you scroll, you can see that there's like very subtle animations going on when the parts of the page load. So for example, when I scroll, it kind of like phases in from the bottom. And so like, even though they don't use like a whole lot of animation here, like it's super subtle and it's, it does like the job in terms of displaying the content on the page and then not like a super static way. So I think the main like, feature or like design aspect that they use on their website is graphics. Now you can see that the graphics take up, I would say like more space than the text itself. So they really try to attract the user's attention through the graphics that they use. Um, and again, it kind of 
comes back in circle with like their whole personality that they're trying to advertise to their users. So it's more like kid-like, it's more like gamey, uh, stuff like that. And then the last two examples um, are quite the opposite. So we have Vogue. Um, and as you can see, like immediately, the font styles are very different. So previously we saw a lot of like tech companies and they use very like round or like bolded sans serif font. Whereas something like Vogue, which is like a little more traditional um, and kind of adheres to that like magazine feel, um, they use a lot of serif fonts. So like the title or like the logo for Vogue is serif. And then the titles of each articles are also serif. So that really communicates like a different personality to the user. Like it's very chic and very like modern and like fashion, um, but also like traditional um, and like kind of like has that like newspaper feel to it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the personality that they're going for on this website. Um, and as you can see, like the colors um, mainly come from the thumbnails of the articles themselves. Like if you were to just get rid of the thumbnails, you'd see that like there's like only basically two colors that they use, like black and then like variations of black and then like this um, very subtle maroon color. So yeah, they keep it like pretty simple, pretty minimalistic, um, just so that like it has that sort of like expensive feel to it. And then the last one is pretty similar, um, just because Owl has a very similar business model to those. It's also like a fashion magazine. So, well, actually this is a bit different than Vogue because they have this huge image on the very front when you first go onto the landing page. And so this is a really interesting way of how they use images on the website. Like, I don't know about you, but like, honestly, this image is like a bit, like weird because like I feel like she's staring right into my soul um but it kind of gives off that like sort of like idiosyncratic feel or like like borderline strange but also like you know like high fashion sort of thing so like I guess their usage of image is here is like really effective um, and then immediately you also read this text right here yeah I don't really know about the pink color here that they use. It doesn't really match the, the backdrop image, um, but I think that's like the image or like the color they use for their branding. So they have to stick with that. Yeah. So as you can see, like they sort of have a little, more, a little bit more coloring to their website. Um, they have like this tan background and they have the pink stuff that's kind of like infiltrated various sections of the website. So yeah, it's like, still adhering to like that feeling of like a fashion magazine, but um, it's a bit of like a different flavor. Yeah. And with that, um, the design lecture is over. So um, do you guys have any questions about anything I've covered so far with regards to like motion and flow as well as aesthetics? Feel free to like unmute yourself and ask or like type in the chat if you have any questions. Um, but I'm assuming no one has any questions. So we'll just take a five minute break right now before we go into the programming lecture. Okay, so as Julia mentioned earlier, today's programming lecture is gonna be on CSS animations. And this very much continues the theme of the design lecture that we just had. So with animations, we can create really nice dynamic websites. Again, we saw a lot of examples with the websites that Julia just went over. And here's another example right here. We may not be able to do all of this um, in the scope of this class, but we can break this page down into a lot of smaller animations, many of which we can do purely using just CSS, or you can learn yourself using JavaScript when we go over that in the class. And it allows us to express our brands and identities in ways that we haven't before, um, allowing for a lot more possibilities with things that like kind of move across the page. 
So we think about what is an animation and we can break that down into simply a change of state over time. So with this little button right here, we have a starting state, we have an ending state, and then everything in between is gonna move accordingly to get from this starting state to this ending state. And all of this can be done using just CSS. So first we'll start off by looking at this idea um, in CSS called a keyframe. So the syntax for a keyframe looks like this. We have at keyframes and then we have a name and inside here, inside these curly braces, just like in the regular CSS syntax that we've seen, we have a set of rules. And a keyframe is essentially a set of rules for what to do during an animation. It's not saying that a specific element is gonna have a certain animation. It's just a set of rules for any kind of generic animation. And after we define this keyframe with these rules, we can apply this to any element that we want later. So that element we apply it to will follow these animation rules and kind of move around and behave accordingly. So writing rules, there's two ways to do it, using from and to and using percentages. First, let's just talk about writing these um, CSS animation rules using just from and to. So we see here that we have a keyframe, add keyframes, and then the name is fade in. And the rules here are starting from opacity one, we want to go to, sorry, opacity zero, we want to go to opacity one. So it starts invisible, it becomes fully visible, and there's a smooth transition throughout. And that's where this name fade in comes from before something's not gonna be seen and then it's gonna appear on our page. Very similarly, we can use percentages and percentages open up a lot more possibilities. Now we have a very similar keyframe, except instead of fade in, we have fade in out. So we'll start with opacity zero at 0%. That's just the starting point. And then we'll move on to opacity one at 50%. So between zero and 50%, we already have this smooth transition of something becoming completely invisible to completely visible. And finally, at 100%, we'll go all the way back down to opacity zero, which means that it'll start from zero, go to one, become visible, and then go back to zero and then become invisible again. So it's a smooth transition that kind of ends up where it started. Another example is up down. And this example also uses percentages because that's a lot more flexible. We start with an element 100 pixels from the top of our page. So maybe if my camera is like the top of my camera is the top of the page, we would start here. And then at 50%, it's zero pixels from the top of the page. So I'll go all the way up to the very top. At 100%, again, it's going to be 100 pixels from the top of the page. So it's going to go down here. So the complete animation for any given object, maybe like this eraser, it's going to start here. I guess you can't see it, but the tip of my finger, it's going to start here, go all the way up, and go all the way down. So as we just talked about, we can really break down animations into three parts. That's a starting position, embedding position, and then a middle position. And we can generalize this middle position to many, many different positions. We could use like 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way up to 100%. Or we could even use like 0, 30, 100. It doesn't have to be evenly spaced, as long as there's something that it starts with, something that it ends with, and then if you want some stuff in the middle. This is an example of this right here. This um, kind of character starts all the way at the top of the page, goes down, so their hand touches this D in the dive, and then goes all the way back up, and then the animation restarts. So application. Now that we have this keyframe, this set of rules, how do we apply it to a specific element that we want? How do we make this item go up and then down and then back up again? So we simply just put it in the element of our choice. And the syntax for that is this right here, animation name, up, down. This tells us that for this potato head element, we want to apply this animation. So it'll go from the top to the bottom, all the way to the top. And we also need to specify an animation duration. So that's 0 0.5 seconds. That's what this entire process of 0%, 50%, 100% is going to take. And these two that we just saw, name and duration, these are the mandatory properties for any CSS animation. Of course, we need an animation name that tells us what kind of animation we're trying to apply, but we also need an animation duration. If we don't have this duration, nothing's really going to happen on our page. 
Um, you can kind of think of it as like, if the duration is just zero seconds, it's gonna start in it immediately and then we're not gonna be able to see that. I guess in CSS, it just completely ignores whatever animation you have. So there's a lot of different adjustments that we can make beyond these two mandatory properties. So name duration, there's also something called a timing function. So here the timing function is ease in and I'll escape a little bit and give some examples of time, timing functions. Popular ones are like ease in, ease out, ease in out. And what does that actually mean? Well, here we see a timing function ease in cubic. So follow this little dot on the right side. If we hover over this, it starts off very slowly and then it speeds up when it hits the screen. So it starts off slowly and then later on it starts going faster. Kind of opposite of that is ease out cubic. So it starts off very fast. We see this blue dot at the beginning moves very fast. It kind of turns white and then it slows down. We also have ease in out cubic. So it starts fast. It's a little, or it starts slow. It's a little faster in the middle and then it's a little slower at the end. So all of these control how fast our animation is moving over a certain period of time. So if this is zero, right, this is a hundred, maybe from zero to like whatever is going on or time-wise, um, less of the animation is gonna be covered here. Whereas the animation is gonna move a lot faster at the very end. So that's one of these optimal or optional adjustments that we can make. The second one is animation delay. So the nice thing about animations is that we can create these animations without having a certain trigger. For example, if we were using transitions, we would have to hover over something, click something that would trigger some sort of movement. However, for CSS animations, we can start it just on the load of the page. But if we don't want it to start immediately, we could say animation delay zero seconds. So we would open our page, it would wait like if this was five seconds. It would wait five seconds and then complete or start and then complete the animation that we wanted to do. Play number is relatively um, self-descriptive, I guess. This just tells us how many times we want to play this. We could set this to infinite. It'll just keep looping over and over again. And lastly, we have direction. So animation direction forward, I believe, um, will just go from like zero to 100, whereas animation direction reverse, it'll take whatever keyframe you designed. So from zero to like 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way to 100, and it'll do that backwards. So it'll start from the final position, go to like 90, 80, 70, 60, all the way to zero. Um, and then if you want it to iterate more than once, then it would just do that same repeated process, but always being in reverse. And all of those properties, we can do that all in one line using this shorthand. So animation, up, down, 0 0.5 seconds, ease in, 0 seconds, to reverse. That's the same thing as everything here, right? Up, down, 0 0.5 seconds, ease in, 0 seconds, to reverse, except it's in a line. But we have to do it in this specified order. As I mentioned earlier, we have two different options for sort of just making things move on our page purely using CSS. The first one is pseudo selectors, right? Div, hover, then we have some rules. For example, um, we want it to grow bigger like we saw in one of the homework assignments where if we hovered over a circle, it became a little bit bigger or on that like Instagram assignment, right? The opacity changed a little bit. So this is one option, but this would have to respond to a user's actions. And sometimes that's what you want. However, animations, as we saw in a lot of the websites that we had earlier, the animations just kind of run on their own. These are continuous if we set it to be continuous and automatically instigated animations based on whenever we load our page and whenever our like delay property tells the animation to start. So any questions about that so far before we move on to a quick demo? Okay, I'll drop this link in chat. So if you're interested, you can follow along. So here we have, um, this website is called JSBin. It just allows us to do like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript all in one place, and also a console if we want. But we don't need the console right now. We don't need JavaScript. So we'll just look at HTML and CSS. But really, we don't really need the HTML either because this is very 
easy to tell what everything is, right? We have pumpkin, that's this pumpkin. We have shadow, that's this shadow. And our goal here using CSS animations is to make a keyframe for the bouncing pumpkin. So to make it bounce by translating its Y value of negative 200 pixels to 30 pixels. And we also, at the same time, we wanna make another keyframe animation for this shadow it just scale from half its size when the pumpkin is farthest from the ground and vice versa. So as you can imagine, if this pumpkin is moving downwards, the shadow should get smaller because this pumpkin is closer to the ground. This should shrink all the way to zero. And then as this pumpkin moves back up, it should expand a little bit and it should shrink, expand, shrink, expand. And this pumpkin is just going up and down, up and down. So we can start off with a keyframe. So as we mentioned earlier, we'll say, keyframe, and then we can call this animation bounce. So bounce, and then we can have this from, and then to, and then inside we wanna fill this with something. So here would be the starting position. And then here we would want the ending position. Does anyone want to give this a shot? Just throw it in chat based on what you see here, um, what we would want to enter right over here in the starting position and what we would want to enter for the end position. It kind of just gives it away here, but it's for the sake of being interactive. Exactly. So negative 200 pixels to 30 pixels. And what we want to do is a transform. We want to transform and then translate the x-axis, or sorry, translate the y-axis. So that looks like this. And then we could say start off at negative 200 pixels. And then here we would have the same thing, but we end at 30 pixels. So we've defined this keyframe, but nothing really happens to this pumpkin right here. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned, this bounce keyframe is really just purely a set of rules. We have a set of rules that we define. Now we need to apply the set of rules to something. And that something is going to be pumpkin. So we scroll down a little bit here, and then we see that this says use animation property with 0 0.5 seconds duration, ease in timing function, no delay, repeats infinitely, and alternates. And the reason for alternates is even if we, or I guess, okay, let's see, we can try doing it without first. So we can say animation bounce, because that's the name of this keyframe, 0 0.5 seconds, ease in, 0 seconds, infinite. And then, um, so let's type alternate. So here, if we run, this still doesn't do anything. Okay, what are we doing wrong? Oh, keyframes. There we go. Okay, everything works. So now we see that this is bouncing up and down. If we didn't do alternate, then we see that it goes all the way down and then it skips back to the very front. What alternate does is the first iteration of our animation is going to go from negative 200 pixels, which is up here, to 30 pixels, which is down here, which is just kind of an odd thing that happens with these like transform translate things. But it'll go down here, it'll kind of teleport back up and then down here, teleport back up, move down over and over again, which is this weird behavior that we just saw. Whereas alternate, it'll go all the way up here to down here. And then during the second iteration, it'll go from here back up. Third iteration, third iteration it would alternate again from up here to down here. Alternatively, we could use something like 0%, 50%, 100%. So it always ends up in the starting position so that we don't get this really like janky teleporting pumpkin. Um, but just keep that in mind that you want to use something like alternate or you want to start off in the same place. Otherwise it'll go to the very end 
and then skip to where it started again. Any questions about this? Okay, moving on to shadow. Um, so we can call this keyframe shadow size. So keyframes, I'll remember the S this time, shadow. And then we could do the same thing, right? From to, we could also do 0% and then 100%. That'll do the same thing as from and to. So this time we're not really transforming anything, right? Instead, or we are transforming something, but we're not translating the x-axis like position or the y-axis position. What we want to do is we want to scale this object. So what we could use here is transform scale. And then we want to start at one because we want the shadow to start the full size, which is what we see now when the pumpkin is at the very top of our page. Next, at 100%, we want to transform scale zero. So when the pumpkin gets all the way down, so at the very end of the first iteration, when it hits the ground, then the shadow should be zero because we shouldn't see it. It should just be this very tiny thing underneath the pumpkin. So now all we need to do is apply this animation to shadow. And we can use the same thing because it tells us to use the same properties. We'll just copy this over, except we want to change the name. Otherwise, you can just kind of observe what goes on here. If we just copy this, um, the shadow is also going to start bouncing, which is definitely not what we want. So we want to change the animation name to shadow size. However, here you see just because of the nature of JSBin, um, it starts applying this animation as soon as we type it. So now these are very not in sync and it doesn't really make sense. If we just hit this again, it'll just start from the beginning. And then now we can see we have our final animation of the pumpkin going up and down, up and down. And then this shadow shrinking as the pumpkin goes down and then increasing as it goes back up. So I think if you reload this, um, just in case I'm not going to, but I think if you do, you'll be able to see all of these updates on this page. So feel free to play around with this, play around with the different animation properties timing, delay, uh, maybe you want to change these like transform to something else. You can have multiple statements in here too. Um, that's totally fine. Just play around with that. And then you'll have um, an assignment where you explore more about like CSS animations and like loading animations coming this week. Any questions? Okay, if not, um, I guess that's all we have planned for today. If you have any questions that you wanna ask off recording, feel free to stick around. Otherwise, hope you all have a nice rest of your week.